Oh, hiya! Welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga. And this is episode number 165. Oh! Getting out all the fucking excitement out of my body. Need to be relaxed whilst I do this. How the hell are ya? Man, how you doing? Hope you're well, hope you're well hydrated, well rested, well lubricated. Mobility is all in check and all that malarkey. I'm feeling good. I just got back from a four-mile run outside today. Well, exactly 3.8. Um, and I'm feeling good, man. Um, I, I ran at about what 80 mile pace. No, I ran at 80 percent of my max, so that was about a nine minute mile. Um, not too bad. Um, I feel pretty good. My endurance capabilities are ramping up week on week out, and I'm really trying to stick with the plan at the moment. I've got the Power Speed Endurance book, which is somewhere around here. Can't find it. It's somewhere around here, but it's over there anyway. Um, but I'm, at the moment, there's this book called Power Speed Endurance that I kind of is my bible that I kind of go with. I've kind of mentioned it a few times. It was um, made by the guy that did um, CrossFit Endurance, uh, Brian McKenzie, who's now got his own little side thing called, um, I think, The Art of Breath and also Power Speed Endurance. I think there's a there's an app for it too at the moment that you can use that kind of runs through some of the programs that you can purchase. But the book's got the majority of the kind of, the book's got the kind of skeleton program on it that I'm using. And so far it's been great. Like I mentioned before, I think I used it when I did Chipping Him Half Marathon a couple of years ago. Um, it was probably my best half marathon. It wasn't my fastest. I didn't. Um, I think the fastest still is Barcelona, but that was because of my first one, and it came just at the tail end of when I was like running every single day, so it was a little bit different. But I thought the Chippenham half marathon was probably my my strongest run because I felt strong the whole entire way. Um, I didn't once kind of feel like I was going to blow out my ass. I maintained a pretty steady pace, and and I kept that basically throughout the duration of the run, and I only collapse when i got to the finishing line and even then i kind of recovered quite quickly so um, i'm going to stick with what works and kind of keep doing that because you can get the thing about working out that's a bit annoying especially if you work when you work out a lot like i do or most people do is that you end up getting a bit bored of the things that you're doing and you end up wanting to try and change things to get different results or to maybe cut some corners right i've been there too i can i'm, I'm super patient i think i think i've got I feel I've got more patience than the regular person when it comes to working out, but even I can get trapped into that kind of mind thing where you're like, oh man, I don't really want to do this. Let me, let me just do that and that and that and hopefully I'll get the end result. But it doesn't work like that. Working out, like learning a language, like learning how to fight, you can't really cut corners. It's one of those things you just have to kind of do um, consistently. Like even reading, I'd say, is, is another thing that's quite similar to that, right? You just have to continue, continually keep doing it and hopefully over time, um, you become proficient enough where it won't be as hard as it was in the beginning, but then you then have you then reach another standard where you're having to kind of push yourself. So there's always a, a kind of back and forth battle you're having to do. Um, but by and large, the best thing you should do is kind of stick to the basics and go from there. Like even when it comes to the weight loss stuff, right? There's a lot out there about what needs to be done, what works better, but nothing really be some good rest, um, regular exercise and a balanced diet, right? Um, balanced diet includes like, you know, no, no, one wants to think, no processed sugars, no carbohydrates, um, kind of, you know, clean protein, loads of fiber, loads of healthy fats, all the kind, you know, the standard thing that you hear, you hear about, right? Do that more often than not. Try and have your last meal before 6 p.m. And you're basically done, isn't it? Like the weight will just like, you know, melt off of you over over time. But I think some people get caught in that, again, that mind thing where you're like, oh man, I want to cut corners and you end up doing juice fasting, you end up doing some other bullshit and it just doesn't go the way you want it to go. So at the moment, I'm kind of keeping the basic, eating quite healthy, um, doing a 16, eight um, intermittent fast window. So I'm eating for eight hours and then, um, well, eight, I've got eight hour window to, to eat and then um, fasting for 16, which has been pretty decent. And so at the moment now, with my work schedule, I kind of eat at nine or no, I eat now, right? Between like eight, between like eight and nine. And then my last meal is usually about three to four. And then, you know, same again the next day which isn't too bad if all things considered. But apart from that, I'm feeling pretty good, feeling pretty fresh. Um, The weird thing about this working out thing is I've got a little bonus on top of what I do, right? So this new place where I started at, um, job-wise, they have a they have a gym built into the office, right? An actual real gym, not like, you know, some places you go to, it's like, have you ever been to those hotels where they say they have a gym and you go in there, it's just like an ellipt elliptical machine or a running machine, a couple of kettlebells. Nah, this isn't an actual gym. So in this actual gym, They've got, you know, a, a whole like rig set up where you can do back squats, uh, overhead presses. Um, you can use the barbell to do bench presses. You can do deadlifts. Then they've got a little section with an elliptical machine. Then they've got that, um, I think it's the concept. What's, what's the bike where it's got the levers on the hands that you kind of go forward and backward to. They've got um, a leg press. 
um, pull up bars, a punching bag, um, basically anything you want. They've got some cables um, that you can do lateral pull downs or that sort of malarkey with just everything that you'd want. But, you know, again, like with me, I, I like to have my stuff separate. I'm not somebody that enjoys a whole, um, you know, immersive uh, office space stuff or, you know, the office space where, you know, everything is there that you never need. So you don't need to, so you don't need to leave. I think that's again a little bit of a trap. It's sort of like the open workspace motif, right? Where everyone has everyone can kind of claim a bit of your time because you know there's no kind of wall separating you for the most part. That gets a bit annoying. Um, I'm not really a fan of all that. I kind of kind of I want to try to stay away from that particular kind of zone. And in general, I think there is something kind of disciplined and something kind of regimented about doing my workouts before I go to work, right? Like this is my time. I don't want I don't want my time to encroach. I don't want they, they I don't want a workplace to take away from my time, right? Um, so the idea is that I have this hours, these hours before I go to work, where I can just do the fuck I want, whether it's podcasting, whether it's making a mix, whether it's writing, whether it's reading a book, and I want to keep that to myself. I don't want to then go and hand it over to workplace because, you know, unless my workplace was around the corner to where I lived. That might work where I could just probably pop in and come back home. But I don't want to do that either. Do you know what I mean? I want to just be at home. I don't want to have to. It's like, it's like going into work when you're not in. No one no one wants to do that. I know I don't. I know some people like doing it, but I don't. And um, it's interesting because now, as the years have gone by, especially with this new place now where it's quite a fun place to be. People like hanging out there. People like staying there, having quote unquote lock-ins and, you know, having drinks and inviting their friends around. It's funny because I think if this would have happened to me a couple of years ago, if I if I would have been in this job like a few years ago, I would have been so into it. I would have been all over this stuff, right? I would have been there attending the parties, getting wasted, all this sort of shit. But now the older I've gone, or the you know, with with I guess with age, with experience, and maybe with clarity of mind, right? Now I've kind of figured out that I really don't want to be employed anymore. I kind of just want to do my own thing for sure, for sure, for sure. So these jobs for instance are just little i wouldn't say stop gaps but they're they're they enable me to um do the things that i love outside of work that's what i'd like to term it i don't like the term stop back stop gap because i think that's quite disrespectful um i had a little conversation with some guy actually in morrison's about that the other day um a butcher who was i was i think because he was in there by himself i'm um, having to man two uh butcher stand things you know where they serve the meats because i guess the other person i was meant to come in um called in sick so there were massive queues forming. He was having to run back and forth, you know. And everyone, of course, in the queue was felt sorry for him and didn't really kick up a fuss, which was quite incredible because people can be quite selfish sometimes. But everyone could clearly see that, yeah, no, this guy's stretched too thin. No one else is in. They're short staff. So he's the only one that can do that job. So whatever. And I'm sure no one from the shop floor can just go and to some meat counter start handling meats, right? It takes a particular kind of person to do it, a particular kind of training, maybe certification, whatever it may be. And I had a little conversation with him as he was doing my stuff, like, oh, you know, like, um, how annoying it must be, right? Working in this place where people could just decide they don't want to come in. But, you know, those are the same people that then complain when they don't have jobs, isn't it? People have to be grateful for jobs they got. And this is something like offhand, like, oh, but who'd want this job? And I reply back to him, it's like, no, you should be proud of the job that you have, right? Because not everyone, again, I didn't want to lecture the guy. It sounds like I, I did lecture him, but I didn't. But I think you should be proud of any job you have, right? You should be proud of any place that gives you money in exchange for time. It might not be the most advantageous thing to do. It might not be the most lucrative thing. It might not be the most enjoyable thing. But the idea that a place will give you money in exchange for you giving them a bit of your time, especially when most people were well, going to do jack shit with that time, right? How many times? How many times have you been off work, sick or whatever it was, and had the whole day free and end up just scratching your fucking nuts? Yeah, right. No one usually does much when they got days off anyway. So sometimes when you're at home. If someone could give you money to just do some work that you, you know, wouldn't mind doing and you leave at a reasonable time and you get home and get to see your kids and shit and you get to take your your wife out for dinner a couple of times in a week. I don't think that's any that's that's bad for the most part, right? So I say that to him and I think in general I'm the same, right? I'm very appreciative of the fact that I have a job. I'm very appreciative of the fact that I have somewhere that can pay me. Um, somewhere that it seems relatively fun to be at and people seem to enjoy it. But I think in general, my eyesight is definitely set on the long-term goal or the short-term goal, right? Um, of like getting out of that fucking employment rat race and just being on my own and doing my own thing. Because, you know, like again, I said, I think a part of me wishes I could partake and be as fun as I'm sure the people at that place want me to be as right because I'm I think I'm a little I'm being a little bit within myself and kind of keep myself to myself and not really being that expressive and open about stuff or you know or just having fun in general I'm being a little bit uptight but there's a part of me also that's like I can't I can't waste any more time it's February man like um well it's the last day of February right it's the 20 is it 20th today 
Um, I'm going to go, I don't want to date this, but yeah, it's the 28th today. It's the last day of February. Um, we're going to head into March now. We're already three months into the new year. I can't waste any more time. Like, and it's just so weird how much time, how quickly time passes you by when you're just doing shit that you don't really want to do, right? So I don't want to have to do that. I want to live my best years of my life doing the things that I enjoy. And then hopefully that would then make me a better friend, a better family member, a better whatever. Do you know what I mean? I'd be a better contributor to society. Um, that would just help out in general, I think, as opposed to just all of us collectively being stuck in places we don't want to be at. But there's also a side of me that's also very appreciative, like I said, of the fact that I have, an, I have a job, have, I'm being employed. So I think for those people out there that are a little bit, you know, skeptical, a little bit skeptical, a little bit cynical when it comes to having a job and always a bit, you know, glass half empty, I think you should look at it as an opportunity to grow, as an opportunity to kind of get your mind right and to kind of steer the boat in the direction that you wanted to go to. And sometimes I think as well, for some people, not for me, but some people do need that structure, right? They need that money to Friday, nine to five structure. And then outside of that, they can then do their thing. Sometimes we give people too much time it won't necessarily work, which might be the reason why people think the universal basic income thing might not work out, right? Um, universal basic income is the this idea that um, people that earn a, under a, under a certain amount of a certain threshold will be given um, a stipend, like a, an allowance, every month, like whether it's a grand or twelve hundred pounds. And the idea is that with that money, then you could you could you could you could effectively live if you wanted to, because I can I could live on that money. But you could then do other vocational work on top of it if you wanted to pursue your other actual passions. and But then some people would argue that, you know, given too much time, people won't do jack shit, right? But get high or get wasted. Like, uh, people need some sort of um, an, a reason to get up. And sometimes you feel like, even though it's gay and it's annoying, you feel sometimes a lot of people get a lot of satisfaction out of the fact that they have to put their work clothes on, get on the train, go to work, clock in, say hi to someone, get their coffee, set their laptop, check their email. People get satisfaction out of it, even though it's fucking bullshit and you're not really contributing anything to society. And if anything, you're just, you know, um, dying a slow death at the desk. Um, there is something quite, it's, it's, it's a selfless act. There's something quite gratifying about the idea of getting up and going to work, right? You feel like you're earning your money, you're earning your keep. You have a reason to kind of be alive, which is sad, really, if you think about it, right? Um, using work and employment as a reason to be alive is sad. But, you know, um, we all have our role to play in life. And I guess that is the role that some people have to play. And I don't want to play that role in general, but I'm happy that someone has given me a role to play for the time being. And, you know, in the future, things will change. Um, what happened yesterday? Yesterday, watch United v. Palace. Uh, we won 3-1. Great result. Again, it needs to, it, it kind of doesn't need to be said, but, you know, it's probably likely that Solskjaer is going to get the job, right? Um, I think the way the team has reacted to him, the ambiance around the squad, the fact, the way that he handles the press, um, just the manner of our victories. We are now grinding out professional wins against Palace away. Those are the kind of matches we might, might have lost under Mourinho or we might have won in very dubious circumstances. The fact that he has all the players pulling in the same direction. The fact that everyone bar maybe Lukaku and Sanchez have really stepped up and shown the qualities that they have has been something gratifying. And it's just, it's just really weird. It's just, again... I think there were some people out there, specifically Stephen Housen from Full Time Devils, who, you know, I think he's walked it back a little bit. But there were some people out there that, that were saying that, oh, um, new managers don't uh, actually contribute as much as people think they do, right? And, you know, of course, but that's patently not true. Um, even the statistics tell you different. We can just tell by our eyes that's not true, right? Some managers come in and, you know, the the vibe of the club gets immediately lifted. Even they do follow that with two defeats, right? It's just about the vibe. It's maybe about ensuring a certain mercurial talent stays at the club and doesn't leave. There are things that go into new managers being appointed that aren't necessarily just results-based, right? And they can sometimes have long-term benefits. And I think Solskjaer has been able to marry those long-term benefits with actual immediate results, which is fucking nuts to think about it. That he's come in and done this, especially for someone that's quote unquote a novice manager who hasn't necessarily managed at the top level. And I know for sure it was going to be a different challenge when he gets a job permanently, um, in terms of the expectation level, and in terms of the pressure, in terms of he won't be treated with kid gloves anymore, in terms of maybe the new personalities he might bring in. Imagine if he brings in a dad himself, he brings if he brings in a Mkhitaryan and it doesn't work out, how do he react to that? There'll be things that will happen that won't necessarily that won't be in his favour, that will help that will test his kind of metal. But I think by and large with the backroom staff, the Kieran McKenna's, the Michael Carrier, the Mike Feeling, I think that whole team, man, they're doing a fucking awesome job and I'm really happy that we finally kind of got things sorted out. It took us a long time. It took us fucking having to go through three managers and spending probably the best part of 50 million in, in, in um, what you call it, 
in unearned wages and whatever it may be called. But now at least we're kind of slowly getting to where we need to get to. Um, but yeah, that was three one against um, you know against uh, Crystal Palace again. Again, not the best of games um, from us in general. But you know those are the kind of games you have to win in order to make sure you're in and amongst the competition for the top four. Um, what else happened? What else happened? Let's go on with some topics. Throw some topics. Da, 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 da. Oh shit! Have you heard about this Jordan Wood stuff? Do you do you care? Do you know? Have I mentioned it before? Um, I don't really care, and I don't really know who this person was prior. But god damn it, man! How many careers? Like, if you look at it right, and you kind of analyze it um, from the outside in, and not being somebody that cares a lot about the Kardashian gossip, how many um, careers have those guys started? I think they get a lot of stick, right, from people in the media, especially um, that Camellia. Who's that Who's that Asian lady that hates Kim Kardashian? She's always talking about her when she promotes Fat Tummy Tea. There's a lot of people that don't really like them, right, and they think they represent everything that's bad and vapid about society. But I think, by and large, like as I mentioned with the job thing, I think we all have a role to play. And I think the Kardashian's role is to represent um, vapid, materialistic um, people for the most part, right? No one is going to Kim Kardashian for insights about, you know, global warming or about the socio the socio. Uh, political um, landscape of certain places in Europe or, I don't know, or Middle East or whatever, right? No one's actually asking those kind of questions, but I think what they do offer is a look into that world, right? What it what it means to live that kind of lifestyle of just pure materialism, um, quite a selfish lifestyle for the most part, right? Self-interest, um, the idea of like, you know, promoting all things under the sun as long as it gets money into the bank. Um, just, you know, entertainment lifestyle, right? But what they have done is really provided a platform which people kind of overuse um, to allow other people to kind of jump on and kind of do their own thing, right? From the boyfriends to the ex-boyfriends, ex-husbands to the nanny, stylist, whatever it may be called, they've provided actual jobs, right? And careers for people that will probably go on for decades and decades, isn't it? And this Jordan Woods being another one. I had no idea who this person was prior to this scandal coming out of her supposedly uh, cheating on... Um, was it um chloe's boyfriend right husband or whatever let me be called and i guess the you know the the reason why everyone's in the uproar is because she's best friends with um uh the other one that doesn't make up so because of that um obviously it's a bit you know it's a bit strange but um there is something is there something about the idea of cheating on somebody that's within your immediate family that makes it alluring that makes it really like exciting they must be right because it's not a, it's not an uncommon thing to hear these kind of stories, right? You see him a lot, of course, featured on, you know, trash TV like um, Jeremy Kyle and uh, the, whatever the other guy called, was called that does it in, in the UK. You see a lot happening, right? The idea that somebody with their immediate family will cheat on somebody else in the immediate family. There is something maybe quite um, exhilarating about that. It, might, it must be, right? Um, but thinking about that also, it's also funny how much the, co- the storylines from really trashy families to supposedly really high to do affluent families in the US kind of correlate, right? There's a lot of correlation between them in terms of interpersonal uh, family drama, isn't it? Don't you think so? Like from trashy trailer trash quote unquote families to like Kardashians, they have a lot in common in terms of their storylines in terms of, you know, um, I don't know, sex changes, drug over, drug, drug, um, uh, a problem with drugs, um, obesity, um you know what you call it infidelity there's loads of kind of parallels isn't it i, I wonder if someone's made uh a report and essay on that. it must be right i would imagine so and now it transpires this girl's gonna go on um this jordan girl's gonna go on what's her face called um jada pinkett smith's talk show the red table to talk about it. and i'm like what can she possibly talk about and this is kind of the problem right i think in general with um this is a really stretch but just stay with me right this is the issue that i probably have with feminism in the most part um, let's imagine feminists are right and we do live in a male patriarchy, right? Let's imagine there are these tyrannical men wandering around the streets beating their chest and wanting to devour women, right? And kind of, you know, um, turn them into the hands may tail shit, right? Plot. Imagine that's true. Cool, no worries. But there is something about the idea of women being able to police themselves well and being able to have some sort of checks and balances or some kind of decorum or some kind of moral backbone or something, right? That elevates them above um males or, or above tyrannical men it has to exist because i know there's some women out there that would say oh um you're complaining about me- women going around cheating but then guys do the same thing but it's like we know guys do the same thing it's not good what when guys do it girls should maybe step above maybe girls should maybe have higher standards and try and set an example for the men who are fucking you know just 
uh, chase their dick around. That's what women should do, um, you know, on paper, in order to kind of hopefully um, progress humanity a bit further. But I think if we both start playing in the mud, we're not going to get anywhere, really, are we? If you think about it, it's not going to work. Um, and sometimes I think to myself, these kind of things only really happen amongst women, right? This is just a women-on-women women issue, right? This Jordan girl and this Chloe Kardashian thing. This is like a betrayal of women's quote-unquote trust. And it does kind of bear to, it puts it in plain view that there is no sisterhood. This whole feminist thing is, doesn't exist because there's probably as many women out there who are against feminists, there are women that are for feminists. And I guess there is probably a stat out there that says for the most part in the Western Hemisphere, feminism, feminism is down, you know, across the board. Because a lot of women, especially women of other races and stuff like that, don't really, um, associ- don't really see themselves in the wider feminist movement because it doesn't really speak to them and their kind of um, day-to-day issues. But there is something really sad about this, you know, about how it kind of really pans out in reality, right? There's this idea that women should stick together and they're on a women's march. But by and large, the people that are really stabbing women in the back are other women. It's not really men for the most part, right? It's not. Um, there might be a lot of men in powerful positions, but... There is also this reality um, that you have to kind of wrestle with in your head that real power, you can't have, power isn't tyrannical. You can't lead, you can't build nation with just pure power. Eventually, the populace will topple you and kind of overthrow you. You know, we can just read the history books to see that happening, you know, again and again and again. You have to be able to rule with some kind of cooperation. You can't just rule with an iron fist. It doesn't work out that way Um, in general, right? So... There is something to say about like how culpable women are in this kind of inter- in this kind of whole drama. Again, you have to, you know, Tristan guy has a lot to blame for this issue. We we get that, but you know, if you're the Jordan girl and you know this Kylie girl is your best friend and that um, sister happens to be your sister-in-law, that's a bit funky, isn't it? Bit bit funky. But again, no, I'm not one to judge. Um, I'll be glued to my laptop to see what she's going to say on the red table talk. But it's like you know, like women have to like you have to call this shit out a little bit. Like, really? What the fuck is she going to talk about? For real? Unless there's something that most of the media have got completely wrong and usually these gossip media um, sites um, uh, annoyingly are really into people's business and they get all the information somehow or the other, which is another thing that really pisses me off. Like, we find out things that we probably should never, ever know. People don't have any private business anymore, which is why I really, I wonder why even some celebrities even bother whispering, right? We're going to find out, right? No one, everyone knows everything about you. And if we don't know, it's because somebody's waiting for something else to come out. Like, eventually everyone will know what's happening. Um, But again, like, what can she really say? It's like this whole Jussie Smollett thing, isn't it? I'm just glued to find out what's going to happen. Like, how are they going to be able... But then I guess if you look, if you think about it, who's more likely to have the career again, to bounce back and kind of turn it into a book, turn it into a podcast or a TV show, uh, turn it into a whole fucking new media press run? Probably Jussie, right? I'm assuming. If he, if he plays the whole mental health card, he can probably finagle his way out of that. But if you're the Jordan Woods girl, how are you really going to... But maybe you could, man. People don't really give a shit, though. Really do they, right? This will be out of the news cycle in about what a couple of days um everyone will be oh that's like you know for the most part who really knows about this whole issue people on the internet like me and apart from that no one really in it so i guess i guess maybe jordan probably bounce back a bit more easier than the justice smiley thing just smiley thing i think because it touches on politics the whole mega cap thing and race and homophobia there are things in there that he's he's probably he's probably done more damage than he'd ever realized um in his entire career right um you've kind of burned bridges that you probably never knew you had in the first place which is the other concerning thing. But I feel like the Jordan Woods thing, for the most part, that personality, you kind of thrive off people giving a shit about you, right? You need people to care about who, who you are in order to kind of sustain that career because, you know, there's no talent, there's no actual, um, uh, you know, physical products coming out of her. Not yet anyway, right? Um, she could release a book or a big shit and then people could touch that. But I don't know. I don't know. It's interesting to see. Let's see what happens. Um, I guess I'm glued to it just in terms of, understanding how people bounce back especially after reading john runson so you've been publicly shamed i think i've been more intrigued about these public displays of shame um people pointing the finger the whole village um square thing i'm really interested to see how people really figure out how to like bounce back from it because it's a really hard thing to do it's something that everyone can do and it takes a certain type of person like the Rio Ferdinand and the Mike Ashley thing with Newcastle, that Newcastle comment he made, right? He just didn't say nothing again. He he made some indirect tweets on Twitter and stuff and, and made her play off like he was um, he was trolling. But he didn't really say anything for the most part. He just kept quiet 
and it kind of went away. But I think that only works in the UK. It doesn't really work in the US. You can't really just shut up and then let it go away. Um, people don't, they won't let up on it. That like TMZ will keep following you around, asking you questions. No one's ever going to let you up on it. So that's why it probably doesn't work in that regard. But I'm interested to see how it works out. Let's see where it goes from there. Um, she's been on Red Table soon, talking to um, Jada Pinkett Smith and her mum. Um, I'm sure there'll be some tissues passed around and shit. And you know, girls love a good cry when they made a mistake. But hey, Ooh, what do I know? Next on the list here, Burberry hoodie. Burberry, Burberry, Burberry. Ah, oh, Burberry. That's the you know the funny thing about Burberry, right? Burberry's all like Reebok in the in the in the, in the eyes that you know a lot of hipsters wear it. A lot of people, a lot of hipsters who kind of you know position themselves as woke or position themselves as very culturally aware. They love Burberry and Reebok. Those are the brands that they try and tie into because it, for them, it kind of gives them this false identity that they're from a working class background for the most part, right? This is just my opinion. It's not the actual factual truth. You can say what you want. I just think that, right? I think most people that wear Reeboks and that wear Burberry want to portray an image of working class culture. They, they have no idea about, right? They have no relation to it, nothing. If anything, you people are the ones in school who took the piss out of people that used to wear Jansport, used to wear Salinger, used to wear these fucking off-key brands they used to buy in sports right? because they didn't have any money. I was one of those people, right? All my boots were Deodora. I didn't have any Adidas or any boots, all those kind of like, until I got to sixth form and I could had, had my own money from EMA and shit. Most of my football boots were Deodora, Umbra, or whatever that may be called, right? So I had no choice but to wear the boots because I had no money. So I had to look like a chav because I had no pee. But these people, especially the ones in fucking hipster land, they want to wear white socks and fucked up um, those robot clerks to look like something they're not, right? And it's funny that in the company that Burberry, which I'm sure has many, many people in there who purport to have black friends, purport to have queer friends, purport to be very culturally advanced and, you know, all about the festivals and fucking looking cool and shit and going to gallery openings all over the place. It's just funny. I find it hilarious, right, that that fucking company, right, would think it is a good idea to put out a hoodie in this climate. Again, for me, I'm not bothered. I'm not offended. I don't give a flying fuck when anyone does these things, right? But it's interesting that in this current climate, right, Burberry, Burberry, the cultural savannah is Burberry. That's got this finger on a post that puts fucking grime artists on their um on their lookbooks. A company that had Heady One soundtrack playing during its runway show, right? They had a Heady One soundtrack playing, right? They tried to they tried to they tried to they tried to stand next to Drill, right? They tried to you know the Burberry. They were like standing next to a fucking drill person with their back with a shoulder to shoulder, like fucking um, I don't know, men in black or some shit, right? Looking like, hey, I've got a black friend, right? Then a heady one track playing on the runway show, and still, still, these motherfuckers decided to put a fucking uh, a hoodie with a noose on the around the corner of it. And then you know, on top of it, they did as well. They did that fucking um, what lighties do, where they um, gel down the edges on the side of it. I don't know, is that is that a, is that a little nod to the? To the to, to the ends, to the estates, right? To the Jades, to the Naomi's, right? <laughs> to the Emmas on the on the block, the girls that everyone everyone wanted, but you know, you know the kind of girls in the estate that all the boys wanted, right? But they'd never go for anyone. They end up fucking hooking up with some fucking goon who end up getting them pregnant at fifteen, and you're all like, "Fucking hell!" Do you know what I mean like some absolute dullard? Like, why was it always like that? From in ends, the nice, the the hottest girls never liked the normal dudes that could actually be cool boyfriends. They always liked the fucking scary goon guys that you know would end up impregnating them and four other girls in the same fucking vicinity but it's just it, honestly i it's just so funny to me that burberry in this current climate would think this would be an an appropriate thing to do what makes it even more funny is that this girl was the one that was complaining about it behind in the, in the <laughs> when they were getting dressed and shit this model i don't know who her name is but she was the one that's kicked up the fuss about it in the first place they ignored her told her to fucking shut the fuck up and walk right we're paying you she obviously shut the fuck up to say walking and i can just imagine her crying on the inside like hello hello darkness my old friend about this idea that all her woke friends would see her in his hoodie <laughs> with a noose around it and they would kind of kick them out they'll kick her out of their all-female group or their fucking artist collective and she'd be banished right she she it, it, there's so many layers to it there's this girl wanting not to be look like she's a fucking racist there's burberry thinking there's no big deal just go out and walk no one's gonna think that we're racist because we've got a noose around our hoodie it's obviously and it's obviously a, a reference to um uh nautica and all that sort of stuff right which you know i don't know dude when you think of burberry do you think of boats i don't i, I think of bmx i think of mountain bikes i think of uh i think of 10 benson hedges um i think of i don't know 
I think of what the palace kids pretend to be like. That's what I think of. Dirty fingernails, um, smell like shit, um, always loud, drinking warm beer. I don't know. Do you know what I mean? Like, um, talking with a Jamaican accent when they're not Jamaican. That's what I think of when I think of Burberry. And then they thought this is a good idea. Ah, oh, Lowe's. Fucking love it, man. I fucking love it. Honestly, I fucking love it. It could happen to a shitter brand, man. Honestly, it could happen to shit. I love Ricardo Tishi. That's my guy, right? Ricardo Tishi, you're like, I'm, I'm, so, I'm, I'm, hap- I'm sad it could happen to this guy because, again, I just think what he did with Givenchy, the idea that he brought that Asco alpha masculine energy on a catwalk, even though, it, you know, most of those guys might not have been heterosexual or straight, whatever it might have been. I just like the idea of having to see visually bigger dudes on a the runway. There was, some, there was something really um cool about that, this idea that he was infatuated with big muscular dudes instead of, you know, wafer thin, Saint Laurent, Raph Simmons kind of um models. That was something that really resonated with me. And I guess maybe because it came about during a time when I was getting into CrossFit and I was kind of getting a bit annoyed with the idea that, you know, the Melbourne representation on Runway was just about, you know, this infatuation with youth. Um, that was it. It was just like everyone looked like a baby, whereas it was, you know, it just didn't make no sense. Like you got you got these um really luxury um Italian brands making great suits, and they got all their people with the modeling. I just all look like they're under twenty five. It makes that like, no one's under twenty five can afford that suit. But anyway, I hate I hate have to I hate to happen to Richard, Ricardo Tishi, right? Ricardo Tishi is my my guy. I'm sorry it happened to him, but this couldn't happen to a more shit brand, man. You know, they try so hard to be cool, um, Burberry. They try so hard to be, like, down with the kids and, like, you know, all this sort of shit. Like, Hedy One on the soundtrack and Lookbook Short Bars, different. Ugh, fuck off. Like, never. Like, I just don't get it. I just don't get the how idea behind it. I don't get it. They had a couple of good things when Christopher Bailey was there. He was doing some cool shit. But then they thought Christopher Bailey was a bit of a square, didn't they, right? They thought oh, Christopher Bailey's not cool enough. He's a businessman. He's like a, he does the whole creative direction. He's a CEO. He's got his finger on the pulse in that way. He just, he just kept that thing running easy right he the most controversial thing he done was the lgbtq the lgbtq collection that he did right for the gay pride thing with the remember that big fur jacket that i think um car de la Vigne wore um that's the most controversial thing um chris bailey did for the most part when he was at burberry he kind of kept his nose clean right they thought but then you know the higher ups at burberry thought he wasn't cool enough right oh we need to get someone else in cool some of the millennials know there we go millennials there you fucking go mate noose around the neck absolute donuts and now they're walking it back and they've got this statement that they put out that made me laugh. <laughs> Honestly, it could happen to a more shit brand. They fucking deserve it, man. Absolute garbage, right? And now they've got this whole statement they put out. I think, um, what was it? Uh, Burberry is, is, this is on The Guardian, right? Burberry launches staff training plan after news hoodie route. Like, what are they going to do? Are they going to get Rodigan in to do fucking cultural awareness programs? Is that what they're going to do? They're going to get fucking Tim Westwood in with a palace t-shirt to stand there and tell them about what <laughs> what black people want to see on the runway. Like, honestly, what the fuck are you going to do? You either got it or you don't. These cultural awareness programs from Starbucks to whoever, they don't work, brother. They don't work. They don't work because you don't know what the fuck you're doing. Right, stay out of fucking um social um I don't know social commentary. Like, just keep your nose out of it. We don't fucking care. Make good clothes that people want to wear. That's it. When you try and play political games, this is what happens. Your hand gets burnt. Anyway, <laughs> let's let's look at this. Right, let's read this article. Burberry launches staff training plan after news hoodie. News hoodie, right? Like, honestly. Oh, I love it. I love it. I love it. I fucking love it, man. I fucking love it. Baby has pledged to give its employees mandatory training to increase the support for the Samaritans um, after widely condemned for putting a jumper with a noose design on the catwalk. A week after the luxury fashion house apologized for the hoodie, um, which ties in the shape of a noose, its chief mar- executive, Marco Gobetti, Marco Gobetti said the brand, think of that what you will, would embrace diversity and inclusion throughout a series of initiatives. What are they going to do? Are they just going to hire loads of black kids? I ain't going to fix it either, you fucking idiots. That's affirmative action. That doesn't work. Hire the people that are best for the job or hire people that represent your fucking brand. That's it may be. Like, I bet you walk into that fucking Burberry office. Will you see one chav there? The, like, of course, this is... And again, this is not saying in a derogatory term because I grew up with chavs. I would identify as a chav back in the day because that was where I was from. Canning Town Custom House sucked my dick from the back, right? Like, I grew up with these people. Like like honestly the people that made Burberry what it is right from football terrorist culture to the people that live in the states are they represented in the actual office of Burberry right the people that actually gave that company cultural relevance are they represented in it probably not 
That's the issue, right? It's not a black and white thing because in the states you find everyone, right? We've got all the patinas, every single, every single color you can imagine lives in the states, and we get on amazing, right? There are no racial fucking tensions happening in the states because we live in what one tower block. We share a bin, we share a lift, we share staircases. We can't, have, we don't have enough, we don't have time to fucking be worried about what an Asian guy around the corner said. We just call him by his name. We don't call him the Asian guy, right? We we don't we actually don't see race in ends for the most part, um. But this idea that you're gonna doing, you're gonna be inclusive. What are you gonna do? You're gonna start um, getting in people. Everyone that's been affected by nooses, right? Um, by color and creed, and then bring them in the office. Now, then, what are the people that are in the office that had nothing to do with this shit? That were just hired because they were actually good at doing their job. What are they gonna think when you just bring in a whole busload of black people into the office to kind of fix the issue? It's fucking nuts. And then now you've got the eyes of the world on those people that are in the office, right? That just come in. Now there's a tension between people that are in there because they didn't agree with it because they weren't part of the decision-making process. It's absolute bullshit. And it just goes to show that some of these companies, like regardless of how big they are, regardless of how many, how amazing they may look on the outside, they don't have a fucking clue, which is why the streetwear brands, for the most part, are taking over. Because at least they have cultural awareness. They by not even trying, right? Because their friends are fucking diverse by just nature of the business that they do, right? Because they actually give a shit about looking into things and picking things apart and not just jumping on trends for the sake of it or not just making news for these because they want to be viral, right? They have a little bit more... I don't know, um, respectability about them, right? They're not a, they're not just there, just going to get viral for the sake of getting viral. But then these same fashion heads are like, oh, let's, it's a return to tailoring. We're going to push away streetwear. Yeah, push us away, you absolute dullards. Because that's what you do when you want to be hip and you want to connect with the kids. You put a noose around the neck. That's what you do. Okay, fuck out of here then. We don't want you. We don't want you in the streetwear world. Get out. Go, 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 go. God almighty. Um... The brand has the brand was has been accused of evoking images of lynching and suicide. Um, including I didn't even know. Oh, so see, so you've got the mental health people, right? The the people out there that are mental that are suffering from mental health or from suicidal thoughts. You've got them riled up, and you've also got people riled up who associate um <laughs> losers with lynching. Oh my God! You've so what are they going to do now? Are they going to hide? Are they going to have a checkbox, a checkbox in the application form of like, oh, have you suffered from suicidal thoughts? Did a news hoodie offend you? Yes or no? What are they going to do? Are they going to have that diversity thing on the back of it? Oh, how do you identify yourself? Like black British, black other, and then start hiring people that tick that box? What are you going to do? That's the issue because fashion suffers from nepotism, doesn't it? By and large, doesn't it? That's what it suffers from. The same thing that fashion heads want to complain about with the street people coming infiltrating their scene, they suffer from it. They, it's just an incestuous hiring circle, right? The same three or four executive bounce arounds from the same, you know, the two fucking big holding companies or big conglomerates from different brands here and there within a space of 12 months. You only go, just go on LinkedIn and look at people that work at some of these highbrow companies, whether it's Chloe, Celine, whatever it may be, and look at where they come from. They just bounce around the same place. They just get pass around the same sort of industry there's, there's no fresh blood coming in so are you surprised when this happens no it's le- so it's less about hiring people based on their color or their creed or background it's more so about when people send in applications maybe hire them for the most part some of these job applications they put on these websites for these big luxury brands they probably don't even look at them they probably look at maybe 10 percent of them most of it is all internal like that's the way of nature of the beast i know from having people that work within those companies for the most part it really doesn't they really don't hire external people for the most part most of the people that they hire come from within because most people that start these companies take really shitty jobs because they just want to get in right if you want to work at dolce gabbana or bad example um if you want to work at prada or you want to work at um saint laurent right you'll take a shitty position you might take a uh a, 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 let's say a weekend staff position at selfridges right working at saint laurent and the idea is that you want to become a marketing uh, brand, a brand manager, right? Or global marketing director or saying a role later on down the line, you want to go work in head office. You just take that weekend job so you can just get in, get in amongst it, right? Uh, maybe go to the office here and there to pick up something, pick up some merchandise or to help out sales, to help out the, uh, what they call them, the display people and shit, right? That's the idea behind it. So you're playing the actual long game. So you have more chance of getting that job because you might meet the hiring manager during a Christmas party. Someone might come to a store and visit it and whatever it may be called. You might get that job quicker than I would, 100%, because you've got the little ins. You know, you know, and then plus they have an internal job board for the most part of these places. So by the time these jobs can't become available to general public like me and you, like they're gone. And the people that they're hiring are the same people that work in that store. The same kind of people. It's, again, incestuous pull. So it's no surprise these things happen. So now they're going to what? 
They're going to hire people that have suicidal thoughts or that kind of tendencies that they've offended. And then they're going to hire people that are offended uh, because of what they associate with lynching. Like, it's just an absolute clusterfuck. Anyway, it continues. Gobetti previously said uh, Burberry was deeply sorry for his distress at uh, the atom of cause, while Ricardo Tucci, credit director, who also apologized, saying he had to come to realize that what it was insensitive. Alongside an image bearing the statement from Gobetti, Burberry included a lengthy caption. Um, oh, let's read the caption, actually, because the caption is the one that fucking has got all the lulls. But, oh. It could happen to a more shittier brand, but I'm just so happy. Like, honestly, they're just so shit. So garbage. They try so hard to be cool, and then look what happens. Like, go and fuck yourself, honestly. And then they want to talk about streetwear taking over, and it's annoying, and they want to return to tailoring. Take your tailoring and stick it up your ass, right? Do you know what I mean? You don't know anything, right? you got Miroslav like Duma and the other woman out here, like, you know, um, saying the N-word loosely amongst themselves, like, you know, like, like, like we're cool. <laughs> You've got this bullshit. You've got the Prada fucking stuff you got the gucci blackface jumper these guys are fucking dullards like and again i'm not i'm not really that offended by it. it's just it's just i'm offended more so about how how they like to go on as if like these jobs are like so covetable and they really have to try and you know there's so much demand and you know the standards are so high no they're not they're not that high at all everyone in there doesn't have a fucking clue we all watch the same things. We all read the same magazines. We all listen to the same podcasts. Like, honestly, what? There's, there's no real gap in knowledge. So if you're out there and you are desperate to get those kind of jobs, don't. Do it on your own. Make your own zine. Start your own Instagram page. Do your own YouTube videos. Like, you don't need those guys, honestly, because they don't have a fucking clue. Yes, it may give you a good check. It may give you a comfortable um, way of living. You'll go to all the fashion weeks, whatever it may be called. But you can do it on your own now. You can become an in Instagram influencer and just stand around with um, looking cool in, in outfits like Lucas Sabat and Lady May and all those kind of people. And people can fly around all over the place. You don't need to be working with these dullard houses and have your name um smudged and disgraced because someone decided a noose hoodie in this fucking super sensitive site it was a good idea imagine any other time cool do it nowadays come on you can't even put a dog collar around a woman probably nowadays if you're a male designer you get dragged even if it was to do with bondage and snm people wouldn't have it so imagine a fucking noose Whew. anyway here's a statement on, on the instagram um, from Burberry says at Burberry we have always sought to build a culture that is diverse open inclusive and one way all percentages are valued i.e their office is open plan they have a coffee machine everyone can use they have bean bags and a foosball table that isn't inclusive you idiots or diverse or open it's the same shit man everyone's got the same opinions in those kind of places everyone listens to the same music right like honestly does it make any sense to you nah to me not to me it continues the distress we've caused um, with one of our products last week was shown has shown us that we are not where we need to be, need or want to be. No, you're not. Because the model, she said, um, excuse me, this is kind of racist. <laughs> the model said it in the back. The model said it, right? And she's white as she's white as you can get, right? She was like, look, guys, this probably isn't the best thing to do. And they were like, nah, shut up, walk. It's all right. No one will care. Shut up, we're paying you. And she's like, all right, I'll go. Yeah, she's with a fucking glue down edges and her noose hoodie with Heady One playing it. Honestly, ah, oh, you couldn't write a better script. <laughs> anyway, it continues. Um, we are determined uh, to learn from this and having spoken with our employees who are all white, experts who are all white, communities all white, um, we have developed a plan to increase our consciousness and understanding of social issues and fully embrace diversity and inclusion. It's not about fully embracing it. Just have your company mirror the people that actually buy it, right? The only people I can think of that buy your fucking garbage shit are the people that hang out with the Wavy Garms crew, um, Asian people that go to Selfridges, um, some black people that want to be cool. I don't know. Those are the people that I really associate with it. And maybe some travels are maybe going off it for the most part. Guys that I know from ENDS usually buy the vintage stuff that they can get a hold of um, on eBay and stuff for cheap, right? I don't really know many people from ENDS that are going out to Burberry and buying stuff that they see in a store. But those three people that I mentioned, right? Asian people, um, the people that hang around wavy gums, who are you know, a whole plethora of people. I don't know where they come from for the most part. Um, and then some black people. Have those people ref reflected in your office. That's it. That's not hard to do. Why is it the people that shop at your company can't actually work at your company? You go into a Burberry store for the most part, or most luxury fashion stores, and you go into the store that you work, that they people work in, but even the sales students, right? That's why streetwear is really amazing. Because if you go into Saint Laurent sometimes, or you go to Rick, Rick Owens is not a good example. Go to Saint Laurent sometimes, or even maybe 
Would you go Saint Laurent pre? Yeah, let's say Saint Laurent. You'll be sometimes you walk in there and you see people that just work there for a job. They don't actually care about the brand, which is really weird, right? For the most part, because they, you know, the the training in the Saint Laurent, especially in a high, in a higher luxury fashion retail store, is quite high. You have to have a really high knowledge base. Um, most of your money is earned by on commission, so you really have to know your shit. But sometimes you go into these places and people don't know, like they, you know, more than they know about the collection about what's meant to be dropping, about what you saw on the runway, which is quite concerning. Whereas if you enter a streetwear store, you go to a Noah, you go to a, a Good Hood when that was around, you go to, um, what's the other store that we have here? You go to an Oi Polloi, um, you go to, uh, you know, Good Hood, yeah, I mentioned, Good Hood. Um, you go to a few of these places, and for the most part, the people that work there give a fuck, cares deeply about the brands that are in there. They're really about that life. They're really about the culture. And they know more about the brand than you do. They know about everything that's coming in, what's sold out, um, what's in the back, what they're going to get in um, coming up I don't know, in the future, what you might see in the line sheet that didn't make it um, to, sell, um, to sales. They know a lot about it, which is interesting, again, like I said, because the fashion scene want to poo-poo streetwear, but they can't even get the fucking um, inclusion thing right. And that just happens because for the most part, those stores, if you're, if you're, especially if you're good hood, they hire based off your interest. Do you know about these brands? Do you know who Shin Takazawa is? Do you know these people, yes or no? If you do, come in, you're hired. Can you work well? Yeah, you're hired, done. And can you sell well on top of that? Bonus points. But do you know the brand? Have you got the knowledge? That's it. That's all they do. And they fucking smash it. You don't get any of these fucking weird situations happening for the most part. <sighs> anyway, it continues. Um, we have a firm foundation from which to build on. No, you don't, mate. You've made a hoodie with a noose around it. That's not a firm foundation. If anything, that shows a lack of foundation. <laughs> we have strong values, outstanding people, and creativity at our core. Uh, what? Is that how you apologize? <laughs> Today we are taking further steps to make real change happen. Marco Gobetti. Marco Gobetti, Burberry Group PLC, man. Uh, honestly, I'm happy it happened to you guys. I'm happy it happened to you guys. You got a bullshit brand. You tried to get Ricardo in to fucking revive it. Chris Bailey was doing nothing wrong. He was churning that company along, you know, making some good pieces here and there, but just keeping it ticking over. No, nothing super um, controversial happened underneath his watch. You tried to be woke. You tried to get involved with the kids. Try to play Heady One on your soundtrack to get us hyped about you and give a shit about Burberry when no one fucking cares about Burberry apart from dirty people who just want to look cool and pretend like they, they, they're from their ends when actually, you know, they're, both of their fucking parents earn 50k a year. Like, fuck off. No one cares, right? No one fucking cares. And if you're gonna, and if they're gonna go ahead and hut and go to and st sit outside central martins and try and pick off a bunch of black people to come work at their company and try and make that as inclusion that's a fucking i'm more offended at that if anything right that isn't how inclusion should go inclusion should be representative of your customer base and it should also be based on um the strongest candidates for the role sometimes take a chance someone we don't have um the all the experience their cv but don't just hire based on the color of their skin because that's fucking awful too Honestly, how do you feel if you're sitting in that office and you had nothing to do with these decisions and they just chuck in a, a boatload of people because uh, they just hide them based on their race? Like, how the fuck would you feel in it? That doesn't, it's not conducive to a, a cooperative workspace. That isn't inclusive. That doesn't call for diverse. That's not really diverse. That's false diversity. That's nonsense, man. Absolute nonsense. These, these companies haven't got a fucking clue. I haven't got a clue. And I'm not here to offer them any solutions either. They can just go and try that again themselves and hopefully they get burned again in public. Ugh. Amazing. Amazing. Burberry flopping. Ooh. Anyway, um, I'm I'm over that. I'm gonna stop getting all, you know, flustered over nothing, but you know, because it's not really my concern. Move on, moving on in. What else has happened here? Evian Water fin oh, finessing. Oh, I love a good finesse. I'm happy this is happening. Even though I don't know why this is happening, I don't really get it. It's all just one big finesse. But, you know, let Virgil get his money, man. Virgil did a collaboration with Evian. Um, I guess it happened in Paris the other day because Paris Fashion Week is blowing up. And Paris Fashion Week has turned into the Coachella for fashion, right? It's like everyone and their mum tries to do an activation around Paris because I guess when it comes to men's or when it comes to fashion in general, when it comes to anything culturally relevant, it's probably Eclipse Freeze, which was probably one of the people things that people like to go to, uh, or Miami Art Bows or Art Bows of Miami. 
and all that sort that happens in December usually, right? Um, it's replaced all those things, hasn't it? If you think about it, like this is that's the place to be. If you want to launch something, if you want to get the eyes of the world to give a shit about the thing that you're doing, launch during Paris Fashion Week. Um, and it seems like everyone's doing it because you know, um, uh, Virgil Abloh's there doing his thing with Evian. Again, I have no idea why this thing's happening. I guess again because if you're, if I guess the the uh, what was happening with the Virgil thing you're seeing is maybe when you reach a certain level of influence, you just get chucked things. You get given opportunities that don't necessarily make any sense, but make a lot of sense for the brand, right? So Evian are probably looking to be culturally relevant. They wanna, um, they wanna kind of break into the youth market. Um, they want to um, have something that makes cultural sense and maybe break uh, standing behind somebody that is, you know, the leader of the youth who's very influential with the youth market is a good way to do it. Um, again, maybe with these industrial or artistic or ar ar architectural design background, maybe that's where it ties in. The whole product design thing I don't really get for the most part, but again, maybe that ties in with the whole IKEA thing. It's a good little brand story in that regard in terms of an, an arc, especially leading up to his um, retrospective um um, exhibition in chicago next year there's a kind of good little lineage art thing going on there and again everything you see for these people isn't by accident when you see virgil aligning himself with these kind of projects and putting it on his instagram all this sort of stuff there's nothing um by coincidence of it when you see him tweeting stuff or putting stuff on his instagram stories you can definitely see that some things were only done for a check but some things when they when spread across all social media platforms you can see that he definitely wanted to be part of his lineage going forward and i guess in general it's quite a cool thing right being able to design a water bottle um especially a refillable one that people tend to always kind of get bone rover my office is full of people that have those fucking annoying water for water, refillable water bottles and they're swigging them thinking that they're going to get healthy from drinking water when they don't work out and they eat like shit but that's a fuck another issue completely but i guess something is quite there's something quite cool about the idea you know of taking your um, creative talents and lending it to a refillable water bottle again we don't have to get it we don't have to know what it's about it's just it might look cool from just the image of what it looks like from the outside that's all well and good um it's just funny the whole song song and dance they kick up about it right activation the launch the doing this thing that's that's what i fucking live for i remember this used to be my day to day this used to be my job doing these fucking marketing events it's so fun because there's so much that goes into these events, right? But on paper, it just looks like you get a DJ booth, you stick it in the corner, you tend to play and you have loads of free bottles around, get, invite some, you know, influential people down, have a photographer and that's it. But there's so much that goes into this. Honestly, so much stress, so much planning, uh, budgeting, uh, everything that really is kind of coherent, co um, dependent on um, the people that work. There. Oh, okay. So there's another bottle too. There's a bottle that's just like a glass bottle, I guess. It's not just so. There's not just a um, refillable water bottle that we saw featured in the other pod in the other um, bits of news online. There is this as well, and obviously the refillable water bottle. There's um, Virgil DJing um, in a building that's adjacent to the Eiffel Tower, which again is fucking awesome for the Instagram moments. And again, these are all bits and pieces that I would have known if I would have worked this project because I've done projects previously in other jobs I worked in before. These are all things that you consider that all add to the fucking story. And when you go present it later in your marketing, ah oh, man, I miss marketing, man. I probably need to get back to doing that and instead of doing community management thing. I need to get back to marketing. Yeah, th this is what makes you just get alive, man. This is this is what puts the energy in these kind of thing, cool projects. Usually, day to day marketing is fucking sending out newsletters and doing paid advertising, uh, marketing on fucking Facebook and all that sort of stuff. But then sometimes you get these really opportunities to kind of you know do um activations in really cooler cooler cool locations with cool people that get it it's just amazing in general um uh, so that looks cool again great instagram great instagram moments for people that were there i'm sure there was a hashtag associated with it um instagram post here as well from evian kind of detailing the whole issue um read a bit of text i don't, I don't really know what the deal was but it says here uh, paris monday two and again see all the little things that they do look at them check out evian uh paris monday 25th of february 2019 on this occasion the paris fashion week evian the visionary designer virgil abloh celebrated the launch of this first collaborative project oh it's, so it's, it's, a, it's a whole collection of things i'm guessing they're going to this initiative which is quite cool it'd be cool if he ties this in with some charity work um i don't know whether it's building wells in uh, places that you know don't have that much water whether it's what's that place in america is it flint michigan right where they were having issues with water too they'll be cool if there was some sort of humanitarian aid tied in with it that was really that was real that was organic nothing that was kind of forced or um just for the gram whatever that would be cool if they did that anyway celebrate the launch of their first creative project for of their limited edition collection one drop can make a rainbow which is funny isn't it right a refill for water that's limited edition that's just you know this there is something quite perverse about that but that's for another day these stylish and collectible products were created to expand ways to hydrate while offering new sustainable choices. In January 2018, Evian announced its commitment to becoming a circular brand by 2015 
thank you all for who came to celebrate. So Circular, I guess, is um, the idea that, you know, we should, and look, and they tagged all the fucking influencers. I wonder how much Lucas Abad got paid for this, mate. Not watching Pockets after the whole uh, um, Snapchat thing. But yeah, they, they tagged all the fucking influencers there, which is fucking cool. And again, if you were, if I was, if it was me and I was working for another marketing brand, another marketing agency, I'd go on the Evian thing, I'd, I'd open, I'd click, right click, open new tab on these people, and I'd contact them, I'd find out what, they, what their rate was and get them on top of, I mean, there's a tie-in involved in this whole thing. Maxime Shermat is a photographer who doesn't have an Instagram, which is fucking bizarre. That's the only thing that I would have changed if I was working this campaign. I would have had somebody that was Instagram famous photographer to come in and do the pictures. Um, somebody that that crew was familiar with, so they would be a little bit more natural in front of the camera, be a little bit more personable, so they, he can tag them on his on these images too. Um, there's a video here that we can we can check out as well, detailing it. One drop can make a rainbow. Flashy, flashy colors, colors. Okay, cool. It's just um, looking. Okay, we got the bottle there. No worries. So there's a glass bottle and there's a refillable bottle as well. So I'm guessing there's it's a two prong project, exclusive collection. It's just funny in exclusive bottles. It's like fucking hell. Where have where where have we gone? Um, more images here of the DJ booth. I guess uh, I guess that's Luca right there. Yeah, it is. Um, wearing the Louis Vuitton little satchel there. Virgil doing his hands in the air. We don't care stance, which is always cringe and funny when DJs do. But yeah, let him get his money, man. It's it's a finesse. It is what it is. Um, so um, here's a quote from Virgil for it. The notion is that one drop of water can create a rainbow. Um, served as inspiration and metaphor to drive my first creative project as Evian's creative advisor. It's, it's, who would have funk it right after making all those pyrex things that he'd be here in Paris doing off white, um, probably researching and um putting together the collection for Louis Vuitton's next collection um, and then doing fucking Evian water bottle stuff, right? Amazing, isn't it? <laughs> Imagine. Who would have funk it? Um, da, 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 sustainable innovation design. As light reflects through, this is again taking impression maybe from the first Louis Vuitton collection that he did. Um, as light reflects through the droplet, it reveals its full polychromatic potential. I love these guys, isn't it? Him and Sammy Ross, man. They love a, they love a big word or two, isn't it? And I guess that's maybe to kind of, you know, you have to separate yourself from uh, people that are on the the zeitgeist at the moment or on the you know artistic crave circuit at the moment you have to kind of differentiate yourself but they love big words in it for the sake of it but anyway discover the first crave project from the glass limited edition collection by evian virgil soma water bottle more info is here why do they always put urls on instagram when you can't click them just put them in a bio man come on see these little things i would have done marketing i need to get back into marketing man. i need to get back into it this is just stuff that will come second nature to me but again little hashtags here um evian x virgil abloh so yeah it's a, it's a finesse it is what it is some people will get a bit annoyed by it but i think sometimes when you reach that level of cultural relevancy that virgil has done you've done the work that he's done and you've earned your stripes and you've done the work i think you, you you're afforded some finesses you're afforded it i think you're afforded it and i'd much rather him get his money than fucking burberry right out there making news hoodies trying to be culturally relevant fuck out of here and then you know and then the thing is imagine right going back to fucking Burberry I know I'm fucking harking on about this but if Burberry decided to hire Jerry Lorenzo right all the fashionista people would be up in arms like, oh it's fucking Burberry can they do that what does he know about fashion Jerry Lorenzo would do a far better job at making Burberry culturally relevant than anyone else that they could get from within their fashion sphere outside of the you know one or two people who are severely who are out there talented right they got like a Martine Rose I'm sure she'd fucking smash it right but if they, any other person any other non-white person they'd get Jerry Lorenzo would do far better then and I put that on my fucking mum 100% but all these fashionista people would be up in arms if they hired Jerry Lorenzo oh he doesn't have any fashion background I just love a Yeezy uh, if he wasn't Kanye's friend Fuck off, man. You guys don't know what you're doing anyway. Get someone else in that does. Get someone that built a brand from the fucking ground up, from the mud. That does it. That could that could do it. Does it, does it. Anyway, what the one? I'm getting myself agitated about stuff that doesn't even matter. But anyway, this is the Action of Zinger Show, episode number 165, I think. Um, thanks for tuning in. It's been a bit of a ranty one today. I've, I've been a bit, I've been, I've been, I've been on one. But you know, sometimes you have to do these kind of things um, and just kind of let 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 them know let them know who's really about, right? Let them know who's really about. Anyway, um, oh, I've, I've now hit 1,000 subscribers on YouTube. So thanks for everyone on YouTube that's been subscribing. I've got 1,000 subs, so that means I can start earning money on YouTube. Bang, bang. Get out here, gang. It won't be much. It'll be a couple of pence, right? Knowing the amount of views that I've got. But it doesn't matter. The fact that, you know, 
It doesn't matter, man. It's just, it's just you know, the ability to earn some money, the ability to put videos out people that like, people like them and they share them and stuff, and some might go viral, some might not. That's cool, man. I like it. I just like being able to create. I think this has been such a good thing for my mental space. It's weird because there's people on here that suffer from burnout or that get mental fatigue from putting stuff on YouTube. But for me, it's been the opposite. It's been this idea of being able to make videos, convert those videos to podcasts, release them onto Spotify, put them onto iTunes store, wherever they may be, right? That's giving me an actual creative outlet. It's made me feel a lot more um, at ease um, with my day to day because now I'm not looking at my laptop thinking, now I want to just kill myself, right? Because I know I've got I've got these other projects I'm doing on the side, right? And they give these are give these things are giving me a purpose. They're giving me a reason to get up in the morning and go for it. Ah, I feel happy now, um, but yeah. Um, thanks for all the subscribers on YouTube. 1,000 subs is amazing. I'm happy for that. Um, keep spreading the word. Let all your friends and family know. And I'll keep doing God's work. Um, calling out the bullshit. Talking about the drama. Um, it, glorifying people that I love. Ignoring people that I don't like. And just continuing doing what I'm doing, man. Um, again, thanks so much for tuning in. It's been Exo Zinger Show, episode number 165. All info regarding me, you can find it in the description. Um, I'm DJ next week. It's Friday, Saturday at the Heathcote and Star and at Free Compasses. Um, you can find details of that located on my website, exonozinger.com. Underneath DJ Gigs, listings will be on there. Anything else, email me, um, message me, um, put a comment down, whatever it may be called, and I'll get back to you when I can. And if I don't see you guys tomorrow, I guess have a good day, right? Right, 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 right. Have a good day. Have a good day. Not you, Burberry, but everyone else have a good day. See ya.